Welcome to Nobilis Erotica, episode 329. I am your host, Nobilis Reed. If you haven't already figured it out, this podcast has dirty words in it. So if you don't want to hear people say words like cock or fuck or pussy, then you should listen to something else. This episode of Nobilis Erotica is sponsored by Circlet Press, the world's leading publisher of erotic science fiction and fantasy since 1992. Celebrate the erotic imagination with them at circlet.com. Before we get to this week's story, here's an update on the Patreon campaign. I have just signed a contract on another submission. It's just the sort of story you folks will like, so I'm getting started on producing that right away. This week's story is Two-Edged Bomb by Lauren Burka, which originally appeared in Like a Mask Removed, Volume 1, Erotic Tales of Superheroes, edited by Bethany Zayats, and published by Circuit Press. Lauren's tarot card told her she would never have a normal life. So far, they have been 100% correct. Circlet Press published her chapbook, Mate, Erotic Edge of SF Fantasy, in 1992, and her kinky fantasy novel, Wishbone, is forthcoming from Torquary Books. You can visit her website at laurenpburka.circlet.com. Our narrator, Josh Roseman, not the trombonist, the other one, lives in Georgia. His fiction has appeared in Asimov's Escape Pod and the cross-genres anthology Fat Girl in a Strange Land. His voice has been heard on Escape Pod, Pseudopod, Starship Sofa, The Dune Steve, and here on Novellus Erotica. Find him online at roseplusman.com, on Twitter as at Listener42, and check out his column Six of the Best, and yes, that's a spanking reference, over at Nerdery Public. Listen through to the end for a coupon code you can use to get a discount when you buy Like a Mask Removed on Circlet.com. Here we go. A Double-Edged Bomb by Lauren P. Burka. Performed by Josh Roseman. Jamie woke from troubled dreams to the sound of running water. The clock said half past three. He rolled over and snatched his robe off the floor with a toe. Bundled against the apartment's cool air, he crossed the carpeted floor to the square of light where Faze had left the bathroom door open. He stood watching the pale body move beyond the blur of the shower door. The soap smell didn't quite disguise the spice of Faze's skin. It's in the news, said Faze. Most of it, anyway. You're okay? asked Jamie. Aren't I always? Do you want breakfast? If you would be so kind. Jamie shuffled out of the steaming bathroom and turned on the lights. The apartment was done in beige and chrome. There was a shelf full of leather-bound books that had come with the place, along with some framed paintings that left no impression on the mind. The monitor took up half of one wall. Jamie turned it on and flipped to the news. The announcer was saying something about a bomb. The screen dissolved in a series of diagrams and maps. Irritated, Jamie switched channels. Dirty bomb beneath the stadium. Jamie switched channels again. Reports are still coming in about the bomb. Halftime at the big game. Jamie remembered. He never followed sports, but the Super Bowl had been the night before. There had been heightened terror alerts, too, but no one paid attention to those. General Caldwell, Faze's handler, appeared in his perfect suit and tie to explain the surgical anti-terror mission and to laud one of the military's technological angels to a grateful country. His speech was liberally sprinkled with words like classified and national security. Sidebars showed photos and names of the suspected terrorists held for questioning. There was a speech by President Anders. Now that the crisis was passed, a selection of average football fans were acting out tearful catharses for the cameras. The coaches of both teams provided a joint interview, their rivalry put to rest by this shared drama. Mayors, rescue workers, and police, relieved to be spared a disaster, but somehow cheated of the chance to be brave, read statements, and blinked in the bright lights. Faze would be hungry. Jamie opened the fridge and pulled out a half dozen eggs, a pair of two-inch thick sirloin steaks, butter, cream, and a jug of orange juice. He scrambled the eggs in one pan while the steaks seared in another. With the heat lowered to cook the steaks through, he toasted four slices of whole wheat bread, then started assembling it all on plates. Faze's steak was almost twice as big. Jamie still didn't eat much, while Faze was always hungry. Jamie smiled at the thought. The shower shut off. 
That was a luxury, all the hot water they wanted, when the rest of the country was on rations. Jamie finished setting out the silverware just as Faze arrived from the bedroom. He wore faded jeans and a black t-shirt. His pearly skin gleamed. Drops of water sprayed from his long, colorless hair. He moved to sit at the kitchen table, then stopped, as if he had just remembered something. Thank you, Jamie, he said, and kissed Jamie on the cheek. Then he sat down and began to massacre breakfast. Jamie felt something heavy and painful and sweet inside his stomach that left little room for food. He nibbled at his eggs and asked, You don't have to eat, do you? Hmm. No, Faze swallowed. But sucking nourishment from the ambient environment isn't half so fun. Besides, the parts stop working right if I don't use them. Oh. He was never quite sure how to make small talk with Faze, or even if he should. Faze didn't initiate conversation, but didn't seem to mind answering. It wasn't easy for Jamie to talk either. Back at the camp, just speaking out of turn could have brought him a kick to the nuts, or a rifle butt to the face. Something painful and nasty that wouldn't disable him for work. Jamie had hundreds of questions locked up like little conversational explosives, and only brought them out when detonation seemed unlikely. He wondered... Why did you choose me? Could I leave if I wanted to, but I don't want to? Do you love me? So, you're a hero again. Faze paused, his fork in the air. I don't like that word. I'm sorry. Jamie looked down at his plate and controlled the urge to flinch. It's not... not your fault, said Faze, rolling the words around his mouth like some strange flavor. The bomb, it was a put-up job. They were going to wait until the game was over, but it looked like the Redskins weren't going to meet the point spread. Jamie winced. They brought out a couple of National Guard companies during halftime instead of the singer with the tits, then evacuated everyone. It wasn't necessary. I had the bomb diagram memorized and was turning the important bits into Caesar salad. But the fainting fans and the guns looked good for the cameras, I guess. Faze never showed the extremes of human emotion, as if temper were outside his specifications. But after almost a year in his company, Jamie knew Faze was not happy. He hated put-up jobs, and knowing about them terrified Jamie. He wanted to ask Faze not to tell him. But sharing the knowledge was one of the few burdens he could carry for his more-than-perfect lover. Jamie had seen Faze for the first time at the camp. Of course Jamie knew what the metahumans looked like, but he had played with a Blaze action figure when he was little. Blaze was the talker. He had muscles, steely blue eyes, a cape, and his own cartoon show. Jamie's older brother had a Maze action figure. Maze always wore a suit with tennis shoes. If the government had a difficult problem, it asked Maze. Sometimes he did special things with computers, and sometimes he just thought, but he always had an answer. When you went on a play date, you only dressed up as Faze if you got picked last. Jamie wanted to be Blaze when he grew up. That was before Jamie found out people like him didn't grow up to be anything. The camp contained 15,000 inmates, all shaved bald and wearing identical clothes. Jamie thought it was funny that they called it a camp. Camp was where you went in the summer to learn to swim, climb trees, make lumpy pieces of art, and where you groped a close friend in the dark and got mosquito bites in places that were hard to explain the next day. This camp had no water or trees, only dirt and pavement. Jamie wasn't even sure where it was. The inmates spent 14 hours a day sewing uniforms, and most of the rest confined to stifling barracks where they tried to sleep under bright surveillance lights. Their diet consisted largely of agricultural surplus food like cheese and soy protein, eaten in silence, overseen by armed guards. Any inmates trying to steal a little comfort from each other disappeared. After three years, Jamie could hardly remember those previous camps or schools, jobs, or family. Gray canvas and gray skies had replaced even the internal landscapes of his dreams. Inmates inclined to take a swing at a guard lost some teeth. The weak, the sickly, the hunger strikers, and the resistors disappeared. Nothing else changed. Even cleaning latrines used by men who ate mostly cheese and beans was more boring than revolting. Jamie kept his head down, did as he was told, and earned no beatings. Jamie had been hauling crates from the trucks when General Caldwell arrived with Faze in tow. It seemed strange to watch them show up by conventional means. They should have walked out of a door in space or appeared in a ball of lightning. Albino, 
wearing dark clothes and darker glasses, his hair in knots from the helicopter prop wash, Faze had stood aloof while the general talked to the camp commander. Jamie crouched, panting in the truck's shade, taking advantage of the disruption to grab a moment's rest and wipe the grit out of his eyes. The camp guard prodded Jamie with a baton. Get moving, you, said the guard. Stop, said Faze. Everyone present had gone completely silent. General Caldwell pursed his lips in an expression that no one ever saw on the news. Bring that one here, he said. Jamie went dizzy from terror and dropped to his knees. The guard towered over Jamie, all uniformed arrogance and sweat, cursed him out and kicked him in the stomach. The pain opened inside Jamie like a firework. Faze stood next to them, guard and inmate, without having crossed the intervening space. Of course, wasn't that what the military had designed him for? Why did you do that? asked Faze. Because force is the only thing these animals understand, said the guard. Sir. I see. Faze kicked the guard in the knee. It wasn't a hard kick, more of a tap, but the guard fell over. He tried to stand up and fell over again, yelping with surprise. From the knee down, the guard's leg had completely and bloodlessly disappeared. Did you understand that? asked Faze. There was no malice in his voice, only curiosity. Please, said the guard, put it back. Faze looked around. There were two other guards near the truck. One of them was on his hands and knees, vomiting. Faze pointed to the remaining man. Bring him, he said. But the guard was shaking too hard to do anything but call for an ambulance. A team of medics sedated the mutilated soldier and took Jamie away on a stretcher. The camp medic was surprisingly gentle. He was a conscript, and, he explained, also gay. I've seen something like this before, he said. There are fags in places so high up that no one can touch them. Sometimes they take one of us home, like you'd adopt a puppy from the pound. Sometimes they come back in a few months and take another one. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you to be hopeful, but what he did to that guard, well, it makes you think, doesn't it? Jamie shivered in the thin hospital johnny. It was as cold inside as it was hot outside. His bruised gut ached. The medical facility was designed to treat wounds and get the inmates back on their feet, so the pain reliever supply was limited. So, Faze is gay? Does look that way, doesn't it? said the medic. How did that happen? He's a metahuman. Just a guess here, but probably the same way it happened to you and me both. Blaze is engaged to a supermodel, you know? If they still need to get laid, then the military didn't take out all the human bits. And humans are funny creatures. I don't like this, Jamie said. Will my lawyer even be able to find me if I get transferred out? The medic frowned. He seemed older than Jamie had thought, his hair grayer, his eyes watery and tired. Get out, son, he said. This may be your only chance. Jamie wondered what the medic knew that he did not. Then he realized that he already knew it. Nothing in the camp changed. The best fate that obedience and lawyers could buy him was a quiet death here. The bedroom was as warm and personal as the rest of the apartment was bare. There were clothes on the floor, but not many. Faze could shake a pair of jeans until they were clean and soft and smelled like they had just come out of the dryer. He could repair a sneaker with his bare hands as easily as he dismantled the nuclear device. At Jamie's request, Faze had covered the walls with band posters from Jamie's childhood. They comforted Jamie and made him feel old at the same time. The pale kids with greasy dyed hair and ripped shirts, black men in baggy sweats and monstrous jewelry, even the girls with dark makeup and torn wedding dresses tugged at his earliest desires. The lead singer, wearing nothing but tight jeans, on his knees, handcuffed to the chain-link fence, seemed faintly absurd now. But Faze had mended all the tears and creases, framed it, and hung it up like an icon. Books stuffed the shelves, rare books, banned books, some fiction, most not. They formed a patchwork atlas of gay sexuality. When Jamie arrived, he had paged through the startling text and photos, noting where Faze had left torn bits of paper to mark something of particular interest. In bed, Faze was like a tourist in a foreign country, methodically ordering the next item on the menu every night. At first, Jamie could refuse him nothing. Faze's skin was so pale and translucent it should have bruised at a touch. But bullets passed through his flesh, or dissolved. His body was as resilient as his appetite was boundless, and his ignorance of practical matters was astonishing. 
Jamie had to explain that humans were not tireless, that they sometimes needed lubrication, and that body parts did not always cooperate with desire. The hardest lesson of all was Jamie's, that he could say no. He could ask, negotiate, or dominate if he wished. In that bed, he began rebuilding the shattered boundaries of his self. But it seemed to take so long, and pieces were missing. Faze spun the dishes in the air and flicked them, suddenly clean, into the cabinets. He followed Jamie to the bedroom, where a fat candle burned in every corner. A cone of amber incense released a curl of smoke into the air. The faces and the music posters watched over them. The metahumans had the ability to turn a man into slightly dirty water with their hands. Jamie had asked Faze repeatedly if he had ever done so by accident, until he realized he was causing his lover so much pain that the answer was probably yes. If Jamie did not trust that he was safe in Faze's bed, then what was the point of him accepting Faze's invitation to be the first man to go there? As for Jamie, he'd spent three years in the care of the soul rapers of Homeland Security, and in the days after Faze manumitted him from the camp, he could hardly piss unless someone ordered him to. It was too easy for them to hurt each other, and too important that they should not. Jamie once had lovers who demanded the most strict equality in all sex acts. He had found their bed games ranged from boring to silly. After some experiments, Faze had agreed. That left the question of how to manage the flow of power and pleasure between them, the sting of lust and the joy of surrender. Now they giggled at the mock seriousness of their made-up ritual. Jamie pulled the quarter out of the pocket of his jeans and held it up. It took no extra senses to watch Faze change. His translucent skin shaded to pink under the candlelight. His breathing accelerated. Jamie rolled the coin between his fingers. He was always the one to toss it. Perhaps it didn't protect the ritual from tampering, but they had drawn the line exactly there. It gave Jamie a couple of extra moments to tease Faze if he wanted. He was too impatient today, though, and tossed the quarter straight up. It fell onto the bed, bounced once, and landed heads up. I can see your pupils dilate, Jamie said to Faze, feeling the strength of the mutual desire connecting them. No, don't look away. Straight at me. While you have the chance. You'll have your face in my crotch when I fuck your mouth. Then down in the covers when I have your ass. Faze flinched. Jamie bit back a laugh. Faze was easy enough about having any part of his body touched. It had never belonged to him. He had a stock part instead of a social security number. If you wanted to embarrass him, touches didn't work. But words did. Every time. Strip down, ordered Jamie. Faze bowed his head, then pulled off his white t-shirt. The sculpted muscles of his torso emerged, stroked lightly by the candlelight. Jamie watched him brush his pale hair back into place. Then he sat down to unlace his leather work boots and tucked them under a chair. His faded jeans followed, folded, with his underwear on top. Faze knelt up on the bed. His wrists clasped at the back of his neck. The hair in his armpits fanned out in the soft light. His heavy erection hung between his marbled thighs. The dusting of hair he did not remove caught the dim light, along with the moisture at the tip of his cock where it showed his need for, his fascination with, the ordinary human who lounged against the pillows. Jamie unbuttoned his own jeans and reached in to play with the head, teasing his cock with his hand the way he teased his mind with the way he treated Faze. And, folded behind that, was the knowledge of what Faze would do to him the next time the coin fell the other way. Faze had no childhood. Thus, a fascination with anything that might speak to it. Like spanking. And he had a very heavy hand. Faze's eyes followed Jamie's hand inside his fly. His mouth opened with every appearance of hunger. Tell me what you want, said Jamie. Faze said nothing. You want to play games, asked Jamie. Then get your clothes on and crawl on out of here. I want your cock, muttered Faze. Oh yeah? What do you want to do with it? The corner of Faze's mouth twitched. I want to suck your cock. Give it to me. Manners. Jamie had let the head peek out some time ago, and Faze couldn't keep his gaze off it. Please, let me suck your cock, said Faze. Then Faze was lying across Jamie's lap, with his lips wrapped around that fat head, all hard and velvet between his lips. Jamie's hips moved, and he forced more and more of the shaft down Faze's throat. 
Faze's body moved as it relearned, as it did every time, that this form of penetration was not merely tolerable, but arousing. Jamie stroked his hair, the back of his neck, and his lips where the shaft disappeared into Faze's mouth. And then he closed his eyes. Some things could be learned from movies. Faze had set out once to prove that giving head was one of them. Movies and a rolled-up tube of bubble wrap. It helped that he could move his tongue in ways that could not possibly be natural. The tip of his long tongue pressed at the point between Jamie's balls. Jamie wasn't so sure what Faze's mouth looked like inside, given the angle of their bodies, but he didn't care either. It went on longer than it should, and that had to be Faze's doing, too. Somewhere in there, Jamie started coming. His cream painted the back of Faze's throat. It wasn't a demanding sort of cum, not draining, not the sort of roll that wrung Jamie dry or put him back in his place. Faze drank down the salt of Jamie's climax, and his hands stole from behind his back and stroked Jamie until he had reached the point of dozing off. Jamie's head nodded. Then he snapped awake. It would have been so easy to sink down into Faze's arms and accept the warmth and affection offered. But it wasn't enough. Not for either of them. He twined his fingers in the hair at the back of Faze's neck and shook him. He said, spread your legs, bitch boy. Jamie scratched his fingernails down the length of Faze's back. One buttock spasmed under the touch. He dug his knuckles into Faze's traps, then used his thumbs on the lats. Faze twitched repeatedly, then moaned as the touches grew crueler and more intimate. He was breathing hard when Jamie rolled his glutes under his hands, circling his fingers in, teasing the hole each time so that Faze kicked down at the bed. Jamie swatted him on the calf. Faze groaned, and his buttocks tensed as Jamie's fingers probed a little closer. Shuddering, Faze arched his back. Jamie lifted his hands away. He lay down beside Faze and nibbled on his ear. Tell me what you want. The answer came with surprising speed, as if Faze had been practicing in a mirror. Fuck me, he said, and kissed Jamie hard on the mouth. Your cock in my hole. I want that. Do you need me to beg? Jamie stroked Faze's body. The pale skin warmed in the cool air. Turning Faze so that he could kiss him again, Jamie worked his tongue deep into his mouth, then said, No need. Grabbing the bottle of warm oil from the side table, Jamie squeezed a steady stream of it down the crack of Faze's ass. The fingers of his other hand caught it and stroked it into the sphincter which loosened to his touch. There was a relief to Faze in losing the metahuman mantle. Since he would never put it down, Jamie had to tear it off him every time. Jamie knew near enough what it felt like. He was not so strong, but he'd spent so long defending himself from meaningless abuse, unanswerable questions, the hunger, the stress position, sleeplessness, the horrible things done with water. He could not just lay down his tightly constructed defenses, but Faze could strip them from him when the coin landed another way. Jamie worked his thumbs into Faze's ass, then pulled the hole open. Faze gasped groaned and clawed at the covers, did it matter if it got easier for them when sex this way was so sweet? Was there a right way to have it? Jamie spread Faze a little wider, watched his body writhe. Fuck me, Faze whispered, sighing as Jamie sent a stream of warm oil into his well-stretched hole. Eventually. Jamie stood and wiped his greasy hands on a towel. He began removing his clothing much more slowly than Faze had his own. He watched Faze's muscles tense and knew he was seething at the weight. Then he lay down on top of Faze and felt his cock lift further as he moved it up and down the oiled silk of Faze's crack. Faze begged with his body, arching his back as if trying to draw in Jamie's cock, but the words poured out of him in a steady stream as well. Needy words, embarrassing words, words that laid bare his heart. It was so hard for Jamie to wait until Faze stopped fighting and lay relaxed and undemanding and quiet beneath him. Jamie worked his hands under Faze's hips and lifted him up so the angle was just right and let the head of his cock enter. The heat of Faze's core stiffened him the rest of the way. The weight hadn't been easy on him either, and now he took it out on his lover. He bit the back of Faze's neck. The earlier climax had given him a steel erection, which he hammered into Faze over and over until the metahuman bit the covers and whimpered. One of the candles burned down in its handmade ceramic dish. In the semi-darkness, Jamie paused grabbed Faze by the hair, and shook him. Spit it out. No, I don't care that you can fix it later if you bite through. Jamie touched the moisture at the corner of Faze's right eye. I want to hear you cry. You're hiding it from me. 
and you are not allowed to do that. After he renewed the lubrication, Jamie pounded Faze's face into the bed. Faze sobbed, wordless, alternately fighting the penetration when the friction grew too harsh and surrendering when he found he had no choice. Jamie felt the sweat stream down his back and the crack of his ass. He'd be relearning these lessons from Faze tomorrow night, or the night after. He'd better teach them properly then. He changed his angle a bit, until he bumped his cock head against Faze's prostate. Then he fucked harder, and the shrieks made him smile. Possibly even Faze couldn't tell him if that hurt or not. Then Jamie rolled them just onto their sides and got some oil onto his right hand. He wrapped it around Faze's carved marble cock and stroked the head with his fingers. On three, he said, or nothing. Jamie tightened his hand around his lover's cock and rubbed his thumb over that spot just below the head. Faze shuddered and his ass clenched around Jamie's cock, but he waited obediently for the count to three. Jamie pounded him and stroked him as long as he could stand because he knew that he could not last beyond Faze's pleasure. He tightened his grip then counted to three. And then Jamie cried out when Faze did. The climax backwashed from the metahuman to the merely human. Pleasure, like colored light, like a well-remembered fragrance, like the taste of a new favorite food, opened up Jamie's mind and surprising parts of his body, trailing outward from his fingertips and his toes as it faded. Faze turned in his arms and kissed him on the lips, gently, so as not to disturb him until the most intense part of the orgasm had drained away. those people who were arrested for the bomb, said Jamie, after the sweat cooled. They were innocent? Faze stirred against him. He had surprised them both by liking to be held, as if both embraces and stillness were rare enough to treasure. Innocent of a bomb plot, yes, but Homeland Security wants them for some reason. Jamie felt his way forward through the tangles of logic. Could they be gay? Or peace activists, fringe religious zealots, tax resistors, draft dodgers, immigrants from the wrong country, inconvenient people. When you took me away from that camp, you left 15,000 men behind. That's not the only camp. How many? Would knowing make you happy? asked Faze. No, but you could do something to help them. He waited, tense, to see what Faze would do with such dangerous words. There were microphones in the apartment, of course. Faze had altered their function, of course. Faze turned over. Should I pick them up and put them somewhere else? Where? Assassinate the president? We'd get another one, and Anders is just a figurehead anyway. Do you think the rest of the world would let us sort out a coup in peace and quiet? Invasion is unlikely, but a thousand little border wars will ignite, and a lot of people will die. When the paint plant blew up last month, I saved, by official count, 843 lives. But 200 people still died. I cannot be made to choose who lives and who dies. It hurts too much. It seemed impossible that bulletproof phase could be wounded by something as mundane as human death. But still, let me finish. Maze is the thinker. He said the military forged us with two edges, and we can cut both ways. We're bored of their war, but if we end it, we have to be very sure of what we're doing. We can't afford human mistakes. Be patient for me, Jamie. Faze pushed himself up on one elbow and kissed Jamie clumsily on the corner of the lips. I'll give you a new world, gift-wrapped, with a pink triangle on it if you want. I just need you to hold me until then. Jamie slipped his arms around Faze in the dark. I can do that as long as you want. And there you have it. Was it good for you? Tell me what you think by calling the voicemail line, sending me an email, or finding me on Twitter. All those ways to contact me are over on the podcast website at nobilis.libson.com. And here are your coupon codes. Go to the circlet.com website and get a 50% discount on the ebook of Like a Mask Removed using the code MASKREMOVED, all run together, before the end of September 2015. 
And if you're listening in the future and you've missed out on that code, you can use Nobilis 2015 to get 20% off any time in 2015. Furthermore, since Like a Mask Remove will be coming out in a special omnibus print edition with both heroes and villains, if you buy it on CreateSpace, you can use the code BMMZARCQ, yes I know, for a 30% discount when buying the print edition. There's a link to that and the ebook edition on the podcast website at nobilis.libson.com. Stay subscribed. In August, we'll have more episodes of Capricious, plus a supervillain story from Circlet Press, and if all goes as planned, an Arthurian tale of deceit and enchantment funded by our generous Patreon backers. Speaking of which, if you'd like to help make the Nobilis Erotica podcast even more awesome so we can pay our authors and voice actors a fair rate for their services, visit patreon.com slash nobilis to make your pledge. You have been listening to the Nobilis Erotica podcast. Theme and incidental music are used under license from Digital Juice. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Until next time, listen hard.